Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Hashida-san. Um, I'm here today, together with uh, 20 co-authors from nine nations, to share their uh, experiences, lessons from previous airborne geophysical surveys to smoothly launch new um, initiative, SCAR Antarctic Rings. Um, it, when it comes to the airborne geophysical surveys, we have already five decades of the history, and it started in the 1970s. And when it started, uh, it was more like a radar measurement from the airplane, and one of the most visible achievements of the international effort is the bed map of the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, by 2000, you can see that there are the several uh, data gaps, and the two are really big data gaps that we called the poles of ignorance. And one of them was filled by the project led by China, Australia, UK, and the US, and the other was filled by the, another project led by Denmark, uh, UK, Norway, and Germany. So at the, as of this year, at the right bottom of the figure, you can see that we have a reasonable data of the better topography of the Antarctic ice sheet, but I would, like to go in, I would like to argue that it is not yet good enough. Um, yes, when I show this slide, I often bring the wine bottle, and that is a good excuse to empty the bottle previous night, but I didn't do that last night, so, but then you can imagine the wine bottle very easily, I think. The coastal regions of Antarctica is very important when it comes to the sea level change in the coming centuries. And I often say that Antarctic coastal region is more like a cork of the wine bottle. We pay attention to the wine, or Antarctic ice, of course, but this cork is not really secure. It's loose, actually. And glaciological settings in Antarctica is more like the wine bottle upside down. So we really need to study that, how this cork is loose, and when it would be looser in the future, and so on. That's really the critical knowledge to understand the Antarctic slows in the global climate change. And for that purpose, we really want to focus in the um, coastal regions of the Antarctic ice sheet. So the left map uh, showing the availability of the better topography data uh, in the coastal regions within 100 kilometers from the grounding line. And you can immediately identify the huge data gap at the right top of the map that is called NB land. Why are there such a huge data gap? Uh, we discussed about it, and uh, I think we're very sure that this, there is a data gap because there is no research stations nearby, and consequently, it is not an area where the um, logistical capabilities are strong. Some people argue to me that, well, Kenny, it's not the main reason. There is the main reason is that there is no scientific interest. I would say that it is not really true. The map, another map showing the amount of ice dis discharge from individual uh, regions. And in the land and the regions where we, have, we do not really have radar data in that region, discharge about 110 gigaton per year. That is very similar to the ice discharge amount from the Amundsen Bay, that's included the Pine Island Glacier and the Twaits Glacier. So that region is not really important, that is at least important enough to consider, but there is still huge data gap. Now, by the way, here in the map, I show, I'm showing the data collected only about uh, after 2000, where we have a very precise po uh, positioning data using GPS. Uh, we also analyzed um, the lead availability all around Antarctica. And here we examined how far we need to go to get the better topography data from the grounding line. And actually about 10% of the grounding line has radar data within one kilometer. It's probably okay enough. But about 40% um, of the grounding line has no data within five kilometers. Well, considering the size of Antarctica, radar data five kilometers away may sound good enough, but it's not true. I'm from Norwegian Polar Institute in Tromsø. That was covered by the ice until, say, 10,000 years ago. So that's a probably good analog of the better topography under the coastal region of the Antarctic ice sheet. And our institute is on the island. And um, if we go just two kilometers 
That means I should go down to the ocean and up to the hill about 400 meters. So that is the scale of the knowledge we have. If we do not have a radar data within five kilometers or two kilometers, it's even harder to make any educational guess of the bed elevation. That is really the fact uh, we need to fill out. The right part showing the data availability of the eight different regions in Antarctica. So within the one kilometer or one to five kilometers or more than five kilometers. And Amundsen Bay and Antarctic Peninsula is relatively data rich region, but still nearly half of the grounding line has no radar data within five kilometers. So you can see that there is no region that have adequate data already. That's why we really need to work all regions of Antarctica. So that's the background why we started a SCAR rings initiative. And the rings doesn't stand for any aquarium. It's just stand for the shape of the survey we would like to make in the logo. Uh, by the way, I brought a lot of uh, stickers and I uh, put it somewhere later, so please uh, take uh, yours. Um, we try to make this project as rings, plural, not single ring. At least we would like to make three completely pan-Antarctic rings. And one should go to the grounding line, we call it a primary ring, where ice start to uh, float. And another one is a landward ring. It's slightly inland, say 10 kilometers inland. That is the area where we would expect grounding line will locate in the coming centuries. And the third one is over the ice shelf or over the open ocean to measure the basimetry under the ocean. So we need at least three rings, ideally many more. And then when I started my talk, I mentioned about uh, airborne geophysics started in the 1970s, and at that time, airborne geophysics means more like just a radar measurement. But nowadays, all instruments are really portable, so we can put a deep sounding radar and gravimeter for the better topography, microwave radar for the surface mass balance, and the magnetometer and the grab together for the ge uh, geology, and the laser altimeter and the uh, cameras to see the surface. So in such a way, rings can be a platform to study the interconnected system and the very complicated process between atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and the geology all together. So this is really a multidisciplinary effort. I think uh, that's enough to tell about the importance and the, the challenges we are facing. And uh, together with um, 20 co-authors, we discuss about What's the key factors of successful um, geophysical missions? And the first answer is obviously international collaboration. But unfortunately, not every international collaboration were successful, and I have some pain lessons as well. So what makes international collaboration really successful? And we came up with this uh, word cloud. Um, logistics planning, open communication, uh, career prioritization, that's all important. But also I like to see ambition, plan B thinking, and risk taking attitude. I think that's all important. And probably one word is missing, that is optimism to keep the project running. So how we can do this kind of measurement? What uh, lessons we can take from the previous surveys? Uh, we, Originally, we thought to think, uh, we thought uh, to send a single airplane all around Antarctica, but it's obviously very difficult to do. It's costly and it's harder to coordinate. So now, what we are thinking is to develop multiple regional projects, coordinate them from the beginning, so that no data gap would be left between the different projects. So, how to do it? Uh, one way is to use multiple research stations, and that is successful already, so we, we can do it. We know it works. And then for such a way, uh, here the red one showing the uh, profiles made by the ISCAP international effort. And then in this way, larger regions can be covered with larger resources. But of course, communication between the stations or between national programs is a challenge. Uh, we know that different programs use different culture, different uh, management styles, and uh, working attitude. So th that is all we need to coordinate together to use this uh, observation mode. The another mode we used before and we want to use is to put a remote field camps. 
the map showing the uh, blue in the map showing the flight made by the Polar Gap project. Uh, we used the uh, South Pole Station together with the two field camps, uh, FD83 and the Seal Mountains. Uh, the benefit of this way is to put the remote, state, uh, remote field camp at the middle of the targeted area so we can reduce the commute quite a lot. But of course, that camp is the middle of nothing, so that's always huge challenges. For example, making a field cache and coordinating the missions between the different uh, camps or station. But we think this is uh, doable and a very important way to make the mission. Um, another uh, way to make uh, such airborne survey is to send an airplane from out of the Antarctica, uh, making a huge uh, long commute. And this is actually the used by NASA Operation Ice Bridge. And then the, the good thing of this kind of mission is that when this is very weather resident uh, process, if the weather is not good in one location, we can send the airplane to the other locations. The airplane is huge and flying very high. So we have a good tolerance for the weather. But when it comes to the coastal regions, the survey target has a very complicated topography. So we rather want to fly low and slow. So that's a little bit different from the uh, uh, benefit of this kind of missions. But this is obviously the option we have. Uh, so far, I discussed about the options using the fixed wing. But helicopter is also a very, very useful option for us. And here you can see the helicopter using the radar with antenna and flying from the icebreaker. So that is good because icebreaker can be, a, say, the base camp in the region where we cannot easily access from the land so that um, we can really target to the regions with some mountains, say, peninsula or coastland, for example. Um, the downside is that uh, this is very uh, sensitive to weather and the range is rather limited, but we can put a fuel cache to extend the region. So um, survey using helicopter is also the good option for us. Uh, very recently, uh, drone is obviously uh, something we have invested. And then, but still, our experience is quite limited, but there are many uh, parallel effort and integrated effort to use drone as a platform of the radar. And here I, I, can sh I showed some example. We use a relatively big drone that can fly, say, 15 to 20,000 kilometers over eight hours with a uh, payload of the 10, kilom 10 kilograms, for example. Uh, but this is also very sensitive to the weather, but the benefit is very obvious. The logistics footprint is definitely smaller than conventional flight, for example, with Twin Water and we want to um, make the drone operation really useful in the uh, RINGS project as well. Okay, so RINGS is not uh, old uh, by, as an organization or the initiative, but that's something many people have discussed over the many years, so in such a way it is old and new. Uh, officially speaking, uh, SCAR developed the action group uh, in 2021, and uh, we so far doubled the membership and it's still increasing. In the last year, we had the first international workshop to identify science priorities. Uh, several weeks ago, RINGS was discussed in the ATCM meeting in Helsinki, and there was a working paper making some recommendations. And one of the recommendations is to encourage the parties to uh, understand the importance of the score RINGS in the context of the sea level rise, and also encourage the parties to make appropriate effort to support uh, internationally coordinated uh, surveys. And here, I'm today at the common up meeting. I'm a glaciologist, so actually this is my first time to join the common up meeting. And uh, I will stay in the meeting for uh, the end of the meeting. So I hope uh, I can learn a lot of uh, lessons from you. Please approach to me and uh, tell me a lot of experiences and the lessons we can take. And then we really hope that the common up will support us as well. And we try to take a lot of lessons. And then the goal of the rings is really coordinate the survey in advance rather than just patch the data together afterwards. So I hope that we would like to have, the, uh, we can have the forum to have the different national programs together, expertise, resources, knowledge, wisdom all together. And we, I think a lot of uh, uh, common up um, 
airborne uh, facilities and the science education um, facilitation groups can help us out in those directions. Um, I put only 20 people um, as a co-authors because they are people uh, mainly working with the airborne geophysics. But then uh, SCAR Action Group links is multidisciplinary, including, the, for example, satellite remote sensing people, ice flow modelers, oceanographers, and geologists, and so on. So we are multidisciplinary and international, and we would like to make this group more uh, efficient and uh, widely open. Thank you for your attention.